This channel has now reached over 10,000 subscribers, which is absolutely crazy. None of us expected it to grow as quickly as it has done over the past few months, and we're all incredibly thankful to everyone who has shown us support. So to celebrate this significant milestone, we thought we'd all contribute together to make this special 10,000 subscriber video. We're going to be taking a look at what the Earth was like 10,000 years ago, what life was like for the humans alive at the time, what the climate was doing, and what ancient animals were still around. This just seemed like an appropriately themed way to celebrate 10,000, so we hope you enjoy it, and thank you all again for showing your support and getting the channel to where it is now. 10,000 years ago, in 8,000 BCE, the world population was around 5 million. Humans inhabited all continents except Antarctica, and our early relatives had already been using copper, the first metal to be worked by humans, for around 700 years. At this point, copper would not have been smelted, but worked through a method called cold working, where the copper is still solid and is bashed and rolled to harden it. The earliest evidence of copper is a pendant from North Iraq. It has been dated to around 8000 BCE and shows that Mesopotamia was at the head of human civilization for many thousands of years. This was mainly due to the Fertile Crescent, which is also known as the Cradle of Humanity, a crescent-shaped region of rich, fertile land that stretches from the Nile to the Euphrates, which gave rise to agriculture and permanent settlement. One of these settlements was Nevali Kori, located in Turkey. Built around 8000 BCE, it is thought to be one of the oldest temples in the world. Sculptures of human figures and reliefs of hands were found on the site. This shows how advanced humans already were at this point in time, as they were creating not just stick figures depicting hunts, but human figures etched in stone, a much more laborious and time-consuming task. The site sadly is now submerged after water from the Euphrates flooded it when the Ataturk Dam was constructed. Jericho is another Neolithic settlement, and is thought to be the first town ever. It was very advanced for its time, with it containing houses made from sun-baked mud bricks and already having city walls, as well as an 8 meter tall tower by around 8000 BCE. It is estimated that over a hundred workers built these structures, suggesting that the idea of social status, with peasants and workers being controlled by lords, had already become a part of human society. It was found that cereals, both domesticated and wild, were being harvested for food here, whereas the majority of the rest of the world were still living by hunting and gathering. Around a thousand years later, the first use of counting tokens was occurring in the Fertile Crescent, more evidence of how advanced the area was. 10,000 years ago in Western Europe, it was still the Mesolithic, since the change between Mesolithic and Neolithic is marked by the point at which plants and animals start to be domesticated. The Neolithic, therefore, came much later for Europe than it did in the Fertile Crescent. Many small dwellings existed, such as Iro in Denmark and Deepcar in Britain. These settlements were more primitive compared to ones in Mesopotamia, with flint tools being used and most people living in mud roundhouses. Humans arrived in the Americas via the Bering Strait around 15,000 years ago, when a land bridge was exposed by low ocean levels. These people were the ancestors of the Native Americans, and their way of life did not change much until Europeans arrived. 10,000 years ago in North America is classed as the Archaic Period, as agriculture was never used on a large scale, so the Neolithic never came about until much, much later. This period was defined by communities that had economies based of nuts and other hunted and gathered materials. The Archaic Period ended in the Americas at different times due to much more advanced civilizations taking root in Central and South America. Mexico, much like the Fertile Crescent, was going through the early Neolithic at this time, with squash plants being domesticated first, and in the Valley of Mexico, chili peppers, aromath, and maize. A 10,000-year-old skeleton was found in an underwater cave in Tulum, showing that humans had made their way from the north to the Yucatan Peninsula. These early villages and squash farms didn't change much for thousands of years, but they were the foundation of the first great civilization in America, the Olmec. And yes, technology was a big thing 10,000 years ago too, but not quite in the same way that it is today. Around 7,000 to 8,000 BCE, the first cultivation of wheat and barley begins in northern Mesopotamia, now Iraq, which was first used for soup and beer, and eventually made into bread. The brilliant modern day machine called the plough hasn't quite been invented yet, so a ploughing stick was used instead. Speeding over to Korea now, the incipient Juleman pottery period kicked off around this time, named perhaps unsurprisingly because there has been many findings of similarly decorated pottery. The early Juleman period is filled with hunting, deep sea fishing, and these people who lived in what were known in Europe as 
Gruben House or Pit Houses. The most famous of these Korean settlements is probably the Am Sedong. These Pit House buildings were basically just half buried in the ground, which provided an enormous protection from weather and also made great places to store food. And let's be honest, there was probably a ton of ancient Juleman dancing and parties going on in these things too. It's probably all they did for entertainment. There is another important thing to note though, remember the copper mines that Ollie talked about earlier? The advent of metal of around this time signifies a great change, the end of the stone age. Lasting 3.6 million years, it came to an end around 10,000 years ago, although many historians argue it ended with the more widespread use of metal working, and the take is closer to 2000 BCE, so more like 4000 years ago. Other technology included the first domestication of animals. People in Mesopotamia, which is this area here, started bringing animals into human life for milk, furs, hides, and of course, meat. Goats were almost certainly the first animals to be tamed by humans, followed closely by chickens. This was trickier than it first sounds, but the easiest animals to tame were the ones that would naturally graze on vegetation. They're easy to feed and they don't need hunters to find meat for them. About 11,000 years ago, the last ice age came to an end, and the Earth was warming up. This was part of the normal cycle of Earth's climate, and was most likely caused by the Milankovitch cycles, which is the way in which slight changes to the Earth's orbit around the Sun can affect the climate. Due to the melting glaciers, sea levels rose dramatically. Britain had been connected to Europe through an exposed land bridge called Doggerland, and this is how humans got to Britain in the first place. However, due to rising sea levels, this large expanse of land flooded and cut Britain off from the rest of Europe. The Bering Strait also flooded, cutting off the humans who had made it to the Americas from the rest of the world. Britain and other places near the glaciers were covered in pine forest and tundra, but as it got hotter, these areas were replaced by birch forests. The Great Plains of America used to be a much wetter region due to the glaciers redirecting rivers running east and sending them south. Many other areas of plains and tundra turned into forests because mass extinction of the megafauna due to the changing climate and spread of humans. As we've just mentioned, 10,000 years ago there was a mass extinction taking place, known as the Quaternary Extinction Event. This devastating mass dying affected animals across multiple continents, wiping out many of the unique creatures that we associate with the Ice Age. This extinction had a particularly devastating effect on the megafauna, and so it's also known as the Quaternary Megafaunal Extinction. Megafauna in this case refers to the large land mammals that dominated the environment several thousand years ago, such as the mammoths, giant sloths, saber-toothed cats and others. The cause of this mass extinction has been strongly debated over the years, and there seem to be two main ideas for what made it happen. Either it was the result of a changing climate that many of the megafauna were not able to adapt to quickly enough, or it was due to humans overhunting many of the animals into extinction. Recent studies have shown a fairly strong link between the spread of early humans and the extinction of megafauna, and so it seems quite likely that our species was responsible for many of the losses caused by this extinction event. So what exactly were the animals? Animals that were dying off around this time. One of these creatures was the woolly rhino, a fairly massive species that was able to reach lengths of over 3 meters, and looked quite similar to some of the more familiar rhino taxa that are still around today. Obviously though, the main feature that makes this animal stand out from its modern relatives is its shaggy fur coat. This coat probably would have made these animals very important sources of clothing for early humans, who likely could have constructed a great deal of warm clothes from the rhinos. Evidence that humans did indeed hunt these creatures, or at least interacted with them, can be found in incredible cave paintings that depict the woolly rhino. Most of these creatures were sadly driven to extinction at the end of the last ice age, about 11,700 years ago, but it is possible that certain populations managed to survive until around 10,000 years ago. However, even if they did, at this time in Earth's history they were a very rare, soon to be completely extinct species. Another interesting animal that was dying off at around this time was the cave hyena. This larger subspecies of hyena inhabited ancient Europe and Asia, and they were fairly numerous throughout much of their time on Earth. These predators are known from bones found in caves that not only preserve hyenas, but also the animals they were preying on, such as the previously mentioned woolly rhinos and wild horses. Terrifyingly, these animals also probably hunted and killed early humans whenever they had the chance, and they are also known to have taken the kills of Neanderthals, as can be seen from bones that show evidence of the animals they belong to being eaten by both Neanderthals and cave hyenas. The true cause of these animals' extinction is not entirely understood, but it seems to have coincided with a change in climate and environment that allowed other predators, such as wolves and humans, to have outcompeted these creatures into extinction. 
Over in North America, there was the American cheetah, a large feline slightly bigger than the modern cheetah that inhabited the open plains of the continent. Despite this animal's name, it turns out that it might not actually have been a cheetah, and was more closely related to the modern day puma. Evidence for this relationship comes from studies examining genetic information. However, even though the American cheetah was most likely not a cheetah, it certainly looked very similar to modern ones, and so probably lived a lifestyle very similar to them, running at high speeds to chase down prey such as wild horses horses and deer. This method of pursuit hunting would have caused an evolutionary convergence to occur, with the anatomy of this puma relative changing to look more like a cheetah's. These animals unfortunately ended up dying out about 10,000 years ago along with the other creatures I've mentioned, once again either due to climatic changes that they were unable to adapt to, or as they were forced into extinction by the spread of early humans. Of course, one of the most well-known of Ice Age animals is another kind of felid, the saber-toothed cat, specifically Smilodon. This large predator, famous for the long canine teeth that project from its mouth, inhabited the Americas during the Pleistocene, before becoming extinct about 10,000 years ago in the mass extinction. The cause of this animal's disappearance is thought to have been due to its prey, which were probably larger creatures such as bison and camels, dying off in the megafaunal extinction. Smilodon seems to have become quite specialised to hunting these big-bodied animals, and once they were gone, it's possible that Smilodon was simply unable to adapt to hunting the faster, more agile prey that remained, such as deer. On the other hand, if this was not the case, then they likely fell prey to the changing climate, or to the spread of humans, which brought them into competition with our early relatives. A fairly unique animal that unfortunately was also dying out around this time was the Cypress Dwarf Hippopotamus. This tiny hippo was a little bit smaller than the still living Pygmy Hippo, with a length of about 120cm and standing approximately 76cm tall at the shoulder. The animal was confined to the island of Cyprus, and through the process of insular dwarfism was able to achieve its small size. And again, sadly, it seems that this species was most likely killed off once the first humans arrived on Cyprus and began hunting it, causing it to disappear about 10,000 years ago. Another group of animals that ended up disappearing around this time were the ground sloths, originating in South America about 35 million years ago, and then eventually migrating into North America, these animals grew to far larger sizes than those of their tree sloth relatives that are still around today. The largest species of ground sloth, Megatherium, was an absolute giant, reaching sizes comparable to modern elephants. These huge herbivores were adapted to feeding on a variety of different plant material, with each species seemingly suited to a different source of food. The ground sloths were also using caves for something, as many of their fossils have been found incredibly well preserved in such locations, with some specimens even preserving fur. There are several theories as to why they might have used caves, perhaps as shelter at night or to cool down during the day. Fossil bones from younger individuals have also been discovered in the caves, so some paleontologists suspect that maybe they were used as a sort of nursery for juveniles. Giant ground sloths disappeared along with the other megafauna about 10,000 years ago, and there certainly seems to be some correlation between the arrival of humans in certain areas and the extinction of the sloths. However, it's also possible that climate change played a large role in their disappearance too. Finally, we couldn't exactly talk about Ice Age animals without including arguably the most famous of all, the mammoths. There were several species of mammoth that lived throughout the Pliocene and Pleistocene, but the woolly mammoth survived the longest, with the majority of the species becoming severely reduced about 10,000 years ago, although small populations on islands did manage to survive for a little longer. In the case of the Wrangell Island mammoths, they actually lasted until less than 4,000 years ago, before finally succumbing to extinction like the rest of their species. The cause of the drastic decline of the species that occurred about 10,000 years ago is not entirely clear, but, again, could have been due to shifting climatic conditions or human overhunting. So there are a few of the unique animals that were around, or just dying out, 10,000 years ago. Obviously there were far more that were becoming extinct this time, and many that had already died out some time before. 10,000 years ago, it was clearly a changing world. With the continued spread of our own species, a changing climate, and developments in technology, this was the beginning of a very different Earth compared to what it had ever been before. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this rough overview of what was happening to our planet 10,000 years ago and found it interesting. We'd just like to thank you all again for what you've done for the channel and getting it to where it is at the moment. It really is incredible that it's grown so quickly. We plan on continuing to upload twice a week for as long as we can, and hopefully start covering some new topics that we haven't done before, as well as of course sticking to our roots in paleontology and evolutionary biology. We hope you'll continue to enjoy our videos, and be sure to let us know how we can improve in the future, as well as telling us what you enjoy seeing the most. Again, thank you, and we'll see you next week for some 7 Days of Science.